Hello, everybody. Is everybody sleepy from lunch, or are you ready to hear me ramble for a little bit? Go for it. Excellent, excellent. Um, so there we are. I got my giant monitor right down there. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, what I, uh, something that I did putting out my own hardcover novel and leveraging my online audience in order to make that a successful venture and what that could possibly mean for big publishing. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today is authors who have an established audience publishing directly to them, selling books directly to them. Talk about audience generation and maintenance, which is a key factor to what we were able to do. Talk about the, pub, the actual publication process of the book we put out called The Rookie. A little bit about the book production process and our 24 city tour, our profit, our loss, and our projections for the future, and then how we can possibly continue to do this and partner with big publishing, or do we abandon big publishing altogether and just do our own thing? So who the hell is this idiot? So he already gave me a little bit of an interview, or an introduction, excuse me, Scott Sigler, New York Times bestselling author, and again, that's fiction, which I think is a little unique here. Uh, there's probably, you probably haven't heard from too many fiction authors. It's mostly nonfiction. Been covered by a few publications. And everything got started with the free serialized podcast novels. Back in, let's go right into that, sorry. So here's a bunch of the podcast novels that I have put out. We started in March of 2005 with the one in the upper corner called Earth Core. And we put this out as a free serialized book. I think it was 24 episodes. And by the time we were done, we had 10,000 listeners tuning in every week to hear what would happen. Uh, people were strung out on it. They couldn't get it in print. It was only available online in audio. So that's when they took to calling themselves the junkies because they were waiting for the next fix every week. So far, I put out eight unabridged audiobooks and four short story collections. As near as we can tell, listeners in about 29 countries. We only put them out in English. So wherever people speak English, we're, we're kind of there getting heard. So far, I've put out over 200 episodes with over 100 hours of unabridged story content. So as people now discover me online and go back and listen to everything I have out, it can take them quite some time. The Future Dark Overlord is a nickname that was given to me by the fans. They started to call me that because uh, the, online person, the online persona is that I'm going to crush the entire world under my evil boot heel. And they get a big kick out of that, have a lot of fun with it. And I mention that because it goes into the naming of the company that put out the book. So talk about the online audience. This is important to establish. There's a reason that we were able to do what we did, because we have so many people online in the social media space that we're communicating with on a daily basis. The biggest part of that is I put out free fiction content every week without fail. Every Sunday, we've got something new, some kind of new story in the feed, uh, something that fans come to expect, and it becomes part of the entertainment budget, just like watching 24 or watching Lost. Since it's there with regularity, it becomes part of their weekly, weekly process, and that helps me retain audience. We also have at least one other piece of audio or video in the feed every week, sometimes two. So we're putting out two to three things in the feed every week. It's on the website. It's delivered via RSS. People can subscribe via email. There's a lot of different ways to get it. Constantly keeps me in front of the audience. We also give out free PDFs of the books. Sometimes those can be serialized. Sometimes they can be given out as a whole book. And I have a backlist. I mentioned I have eight books that are unabridged. If you go to patiobooks.com, where there are, at this point, I think over 350 free author-read audiobooks that are there, and all of mine are up there. So to get out of the storage problems and the RSS problems, I have my backlist over there, and a lot of people discover me from there. I also send a lot of people there to hear my works, and then they get to listen to other authors. So this is a really important point. Every word I have ever published is free, complete, and unabridged. I don't do sample chapters. I don't do a teaser. I don't give you eight episodes and charge you for the ninth. I don't cut the story in half and say, go buy the book if you want the whole thing. It's just lay your cards out on the table. Here it is. Here's the whole story. Go listen to it for free. If you want to come back and buy something later, that's up to you. A focal point of what I do is to put the decision process on the consumer. It's up to them to decide if my content is good enough to pay for. It's not up to me to hold my content hostage and say, well, if you want this, you're going to have to fork over some dough. So that online audience, we interact with them a lot in the social media space. Um, we have, I've set up scottsigler.com basically as a social media site. People create profiles, have avatars, 
communicate with each other quite a bit on there. And we've got 7,000 users signed up there. We're active on Facebook with 2,800 fans and a fan page, you know, 3,500 friends, over 10,000 Twitter followers, and over 6,000 people out on MySpace. Now, these numbers are really not anything special. They're not Ashton Kutcher numbers. They're not Gary Vaynerchuk numbers. They're not Chris Brogan numbers. There are people with hundreds of thousands of followers out on Twitter, uh, you know, like a, a site like Chris Brogan, where people, he'll get 50, 60, 70, 80 comments to everything that he posts. So we're, we're not top of the market, top of the food chain as far as numbers, but these numbers are very, very significant to us because it gives us a large number of people that I can ask to go to go influence this media space, to go buy a book, and it's the constant connection. As a famous president once said, it's about the connection, stupid. So we, don't, we haven't hired people to go bolster up our Twitter numbers. It's not a marketing tactic to us. It's a way that we can stay in front of the audience all the time, and anytime they want access to their favorite author, there he is. He's sitting right out there. You can email him, you can tweet him, you can comment on his blog, and he's going to give you some kind of recognition. Now this connection, this audience, is what led to Ancestor. I'll really walk, I'll walk quickly through the publication history and we'll get into the big media question. So Ancestor is a book I put out with um, Dragon Moon Press, which is a very small Canadian imprint, put out on April 1st. This is a book I had already given away for free. I already had somewhere around 30,000 people download this book, so people, most people who bought it had already heard it. It was, there was no media, no advertising, no distribution. It was just for sale online and from a very small publisher. We hit number seven overall on Amazon.com. We were number one in horror, number one in sci-fi, and number two overall in fiction behind Harry Potter. So this was, at the time, was a, a really big deal because no one had any idea who I was. I didn't have a brand name in the publishing space at all, and there I was topping the charts in my genre at Amazon. That got New York Publishing very excited was able to make a five book deal with Crown Publishing, which led to Infected, which was the first hardcover novel I put out, April 1st, 2008. Now it's also in trade paperback. Um, it's selling really well all over the world at this point. It's printed in 12 languages. It's really fun. Then we had Contagious, which came out later the same year. So it went from absolutely nothing, giving all my books away for free, to two major hardcovers coming out in the same year. Heady times, heady times. That just came out in trade paperback, and when it was in hardcover, that's what hit the New York Times bestseller list. And the next one coming out is Ancestor, June 22nd, 2010. If any of you want to go pre-order it, scottsigler.com slash ancestor. I made it easy for you. So all this is going great with the public, with a big publisher with Crown, so why on earth would I want to go solo and do my own thing? Well, the publishing industry, as you may have heard, is in decline, things are changing, book sales are down, there's consolidations, there's layoffs, imprints are getting scrapped. I don't really want to be on one of the imprints that gets scrapped. There's also management changes. When I signed the deal with Crown Publishing, they were extremely excited about it. Uh, less than a month, the gentleman who, who initiated that deal was gone, and he was replaced by someone else. So within a month of me signing the five book deal and kind of signing my life away for the next five years, I had a brand new boss. If she had not liked my stuff, I would have been screwed. She would have said, push this to the back list, don't worry about it, let's spend our money somewhere else. Fortunately, that didn't happen. She's a, she's a big supporter and we're doing great things together, but it was a big lesson for me right off the bat. I'm like, I need to get something of my own in addition to working with these guys. Marketing budgets vary. You can get absolutely nothing. You can get a decent amount. There's no control. Lack of control over marketing and message is another big thing. I don't get 100% control over how to sell my own books. Sometimes I want to concede that expertise to the people who do it for a living. Other times uh, I know what's right. James Patterson is a, a big proponent in that category. He often goes head to head with his publisher and he just does what he wants to do and he's very successful at it. So really it was control, stability, and owning the rights to everything, not having to talk to anyone to make a decision with at least some of the books. That's why we put out The Rookie. So this is a strange book. It's Any Given Sunday meets The Godfather meets Star Wars. Yes, it is a pro football league 800 years in the future with aliens playing different positions based on their physiology. So, so this, this is a real niche audience for this sucker right here, okay? <laughs> and, it's, and it's young adults, so um, you know I, the kids go crazy for it. People who like football like it. People who are hardcore sci-fi like it. But it did, did not fit into what Crown wanted to do. Crown's trying to pitch me as a mainstream thriller writer. They didn't want it. They also didn't want another publisher to have it. They didn't want confusion in the marketplace. 
about who people called to get the latest Scott Sigler book, et cetera. And we talked about it. I said, that's fair. If I don't put it in bookstores, you guys mind if I sell it myself? So as long as it's not in bookstores, they didn't care. So that led to the founding of Dark Overlord Media. I figure if I'm going to put out my own book, I'm not the future Dark Overlord anymore. I am the Dark Overlord. <laughs> so we named the company that. I partnered with uh, A. Kovacs, who runs a company called Audacity Events in San Diego. They do logistics management, event management. They really know how to handle two, 300,000 people events. A, a totally different skill set that I don't have. I primarily focus on the fiction content and the marketing and the creative interaction with the audience. She handles largely everything else, stuff that was just mystifying to me. So I told her my theory, which is, with the online audience I have, if I can do a pre-order and get a lot of orders to come in ahead of time, we'll bring in all the capital. We'll do it via PayPal. We'll bring in the capital. We'll have the money to publish the book. We will be profitable before we ever print a single page or put out a single copy. Great theory. See how it works. We had absolutely no idea of what we were doing. We were like, this sounds like fun. Let's do this. So some of you are probably saying, well, the authors do this all the time with print on demand. Well, we wanted to do a hardcover novel, eight page color insert. It was about 450 pages. It was a collector's edition. So if you were a fan, you'd heard this story, you wanted that for your bookshelf. We priced it out at lulu.com for print on demand. It was 39 bucks a unit. We would have had to charge 45 to make any money with shipping. I'm asking my fans to spend $50 of their hard earned money on a book and I didn't think that was reasonable at all. We priced out a larger number at some of the print-on-demand places. It was still 20 bucks a unit. We wound up printing with R.R. Donnelly, who's a traditional book publisher. Printed 3,000 copies. We were able to get the same book down to $6 a unit. So we'd be spending six, much, six times as much for print-on-demand. So now we had to figure out how to get the money to fund an actual print run so we could bring the cost per unit down. So we did the pre-order. It's a football book, so we launched it on NFL Draft Day. We like draft the quarterback, buy the book. It was our, our whole marketing scheme because we didn't really have a marketing budget, so we tied to this. We really pushed that it's a limited edition. It's signed, it's numbered. Order now to get your lower number because when these run out, they're completely done. We, used, um, we were able to get different bloggers to blog about it. We were able to get different podcasters to talk about it. We sold it for $34.95 plus promo codes. A lot of people who were Blogging it, we gave them a promo code, like, hey, if you sell copies, you should get three bucks a copy for selling this. That worked out pretty well. We sold 1,000 copies the very first day. So we paid for the print run of 3,000 copies the first day. We were very excited about that. We were profitable. But then we had to actually produce the book. Did I mention we have absolutely no idea of what we were doing here? So if there are any publishers in the house, you guys are probably laughing at us for being so stupid to enter into this uh, endeavor. We crowdsourced, we largely used uh, fans who had, when you give a lot of stuff away for free, you get fans who are getting it for free, and some of those fans, it's the best stuff they've ever heard. Whatever you put out somewhere, there's someone who thinks it's the greatest content they've ever gotten. They get excited, and they want to help you. So we had people coming to us, I, I lay out books, can I help you? I do art, can I help you? We're like, yes, you can. So uh, Donna Mugavira of Sherbrooke Studios did the interior design, cover design, Jerry Scullion, Kevin Capizzi, Kevin, did, Kevin does a lot of 3D work for, Allmart, for Walmart and Pepsi, so a very established guy, but he was helping us out at a cut rate. We had original interior art. The biggest mistake we had, we did not hire a professional proofreader. We thought we could do that on our own between myself and A and Donna. We're all going over the pages. We're like, we'll catch all the errors. We didn't catch all the errors. So the book is a really, really nice quality product. There are several typos in the book, so we will correct that as we go on to the next thing. So we did most of it right, that we definitely did wrong. The fulfillment process, we had the warehouse of doom, which was just a public storage locker. We had the truck ship the books right there, and uh, we did our warehouse, our fulfillment, we did everything at once. The two company owners did all the fulfillment. So this is a real blue collar type endeavor here. Uh, we were stuffing a thousand envelopes, signing, numbering, and personalizing each book. And we had a week to get that done. So we budgeted five days, eight hours each. Piece of cake, right? It's no problem. It's like 40 hours. Well, it really took us nine 12-hour days to get the whole project done. So again, gross underestimation on our part. Um, and as I go into the financial part, that was what we considered to be the sweat equity of our small business. We're not counting our hours towards the cost of the book. We sent it out via priority mail, just the standard priority mail, flat rate envelopes. We didn't do any tracking or insurance to keep our costs down for our customers. 
and yet less than 1% were lost or damaged. We were really happy with that. Uh, the standard United States Postal, Postal Service did a fantastic job, and it worked great. Get in the effing van. So we decided to take the punk rock approach to this, get in the van and tour the country. We did, since we weren't in bookstores, we did sports bars. I had a l less of a turnout at sports bars than I have at bookstores, something else we didn't anticipate. We thought we would be getting 70, 80 people into all the bars like we do in the bookstores. We wound up getting about 20 to 30. It was still a great time. 24 cities in 27 days, over 10,000 miles, close to 700 attendees. We were also selling tour t-shirts. We just had a, generally a great time. The activity on Twitter and on blogging also wound up selling more books for us that month than any other book except for the actual launch. So did it make money? We spent 43 grand on costs, printing, warehouse, the tour. So far we brought in 70,000, we've sold 2,100 copies, and we've sold 365 t-shirts. So, so far we've got a profit margin of about 38%. That being said, we still have 900 copies left, which at the rate we're selling will be gone by the time we do the second book, which ships in September of this year, so that will bring our total profit margin for our first book to 118%-ish, somewhere in that ballpark. So um, we're not setting the world on fire with this one, but clearly we've got something that can be sustainable once we get five, six, seven books out and have a, have a backlist. Again, not factored in, owner labor in this process. So why is this a threat to big publishing? I sold 1,000 copies the first day, 2,100 copies so far, Right now, I'm a mid-list guy. I snuck on the Times list. I've got a pretty good audience. But for the bigger authors, imagine the people who can sell 10,000 copies on their own or some of the big-time authors who can move 50,000 copies on their own. Hire a small staff, sell directly to your audience that you developed online, have a connection with. Do the pre-order, do the print run. You've got online sales directly to your fans. Somebody can sell 50,000 copies at the price we did. That's 1.75 million gross. That's going to be very enticing to some of the bigger authors who can do this kind of thing on their own. If you subtract our cost of publishing, it's 1.35 million coming in. They're gonna have more cost warehouse and having a staff because shipping 50,000 copies is a whole different ball game than shipping 1,000. But at the same time, their print costs are gonna be down considerably because they have such large volume. So if you look, this is where things could get interesting in the near future. If you look at some of the bigger names, if they wanted to do this, uh, they could bring in a crap load of money and not have to share it with anybody. Stephanie Myers in particular, if she was to write a book of short stories about some of the secondary Twilight characters and sell that directly from her website, which is a massive amount of traffic, she could move 200,000, 250,000 copies the first day without batting an eyelash. So that that's, that's the kind of thing that could take away from big publishing and put some of that control back into the hands of the authors. So what it comes down to for the authors is a profit margin of 60%-ish if they want to do it themselves versus a royalty rate of 12%, or even if they're the big timers like King, maybe 20%. Our next step is we're putting out the next book, The Starter. Pre-order, same thing, except we're doing it this time, April 1st, 2010. Again, pushing the sign numbered limited edition. We're gonna try and double our pre-sales this time because we have a lot more traffic going on. The future for us, there's seven books in the Rookie series. We'll be doing one per year. So by the time we get to book four and five, get a backlist going, we think that things are gonna grow exponentially for us, especially when people see, here's a big Harry Potter-esque series, it's just about aliens and football instead of wizards. Um, and part of putting out all that content every week is at this point I have two full novels, three short story collections, and two novellas that aren't under contract but are done. So I've got a lot of content I'm sitting on that if this is successful we can keep putting out my stuff. Then we get into licensing for other properties, we have all the rights, we can do whatever we want. We're looking for foreign translators right now. We're looking for a mass market paperback partner, which we'll probably do by the time the second or third book comes out so that someone else can take these products into the stores. We'll stick to the high margin hardcover as the focal point of our business and then find a mass market publisher who wants to take it to a bigger audience, possibly acquire other authors by 2013, as long as they have their own online audience. The whole focal point of our business model is the pre-sale, having a profitable book before we even print a page or print a copy. So who needs big publishing? I do. It's an and, not an or thing for me. Um, the exposure cycle on both, sa both sides builds sa sales for both sides. The more books I sell in Borders, Barnes & Nobles, the more books I sell in Germany, the more Ancestor sells, the more people find out, become big fans, want everything that I do, and then they go out and find The Rookie, sell more copies of The Rookie. The Rookie is also bringing a lot of people in for the first time. A lot of younger readers, 14, 15, 16, as they get older, they get into their 20s, they start to look for the other books I've done, the more mature thrillers, they go find five and six other books, everybody wins. 
So I have the benefit of working with a big publisher. I also have some degree of self-ownership and security in case publishing goes completely into the crapper. So that's, this is what I told you. We talked about author publishing direct to the established audience. Having an established audience is the key to this. People who are passionate about what you do. You have to generate your audience, maintain your audience. You gotta be communicating with them. We published our book. We did a 24 city book tour, which was huge. Talked about our profit loss projections or future and partnering with big publishing. And if anybody has any questions, or you like the sound of The Rookie as an awesome book for your teenage kids who are into sports or sci-fi and stuff, you can go to scottsigler.com slash The Rookie and have at it. Go to my website. I'm on Twitter. Feel free to tweet me up. And then you can email myself or A at any time if you guys have any general questions. We'll see what we can do to help. That is all.